Welcome to this uh, roundtable panel for uh, workout bankers and credit managers. Uh, we, uh, uh, Bob Riska, uh, my friend, and uh, uh, at Sierra Constellation, wanted to put something together to uh, provide some insights during these incredibly unique times and challenging times uh, for uh, workout bankers and credit managers of private credits. Uh, as there's certainly as it's always a confusing time, but never been so many different type of challenges and knowing which direction and, and people thinking things are going to go one way and then another. So we thought we'd put together a, a group of experts to try to provide insight for everybody to kind of help uh, where things are going. So uh, I'll uh, let uh, Bob Riska in a, in a minute kind of tell you about his firm. I'm Tom Goldblatt, founder of Virginia Capital, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about our firm in a second. But I wanted to kind of uh, talk about the, just introduce our panel who will be speaking, uh, the, uh, the experts. First of all, uh, Jack Ablin, uh, and Jack's the Chief Investment Officer of Crescent Capital. He's also the author of Reading Minds and Markets, Minimizing Risk and Maximizing Returns. He's a frequent contributor to CNBC, Bloomberg, The Wall Street Journal, and Barron's. And Jack is a Professor of Finance at Boston University. Uh, I always love uh, presentations with Jack and uh, you'll get a chance at the end to ask him questions as well. We're also honored to have uh, Dominic uh, Provence. Uh, I hope I said that right, Dominic. Uh, he's uh, the senior financial policy analyst within the supervision and regulation division of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. In this function, Dominic is primarily responsible for conducting an ongoing assessment of risks associated with residential real estate markets and the potential impacts they may pose to the financial system. We're also glad to have uh, my colleague Kovis Vandersil, a partner at Ravinia Capital Performance Improvement, world recognized author and inter interim leader and past winner of the TMA's uh, Large Transaction of the Year Award. Uh, he's passionate to help companies and do assessments and Kovis uh, works for uh, um, instead of hourly fee works on an incentive. Um, so we'll go to the uh, next slide. A little bit about Ravinia Capital. Uh, we're a middle market investment bank based in Chicago. We're a trusted independent advisor to privately held clients specializing in custom transaction processes for distressed companies facing complex or urgent challenges. We uh, partner with clients to sell companies in and out of bankruptcy, find additional capital, find new lenders, prepare, prepare 13 week cash flows, perform holistic business assessments, and create an execution and execute plans under tight deadlines. In all cases, we work with lenders and their clients to assess possible options and proceed deliberately with a tailored plan for maximizing sales proceeds and optimizing outcomes for all stakeholders. We're committed to delivering results and, uh, and we're flexible compensation plans based on success metrics, not just hours worked. Next. And uh, again, we primarily work on success fees. Uh, our wealth of diverse knowledge and experience allows us to buy, identify and implement the best strategies from meeting unique needs of companies facing wide variety of special situations. We focus on solutions and, um, and uh, right now with what we do with capital transactions is probably a, a great way to do uh, workout and help with credit. So we'll get into that more later. I'll introduce now uh, Robert Siska who will tell you a little bit about Sierra Constellation. And after that, we'll uh, get into the uh, meat of the presentation and again, There'll be time at the end for open question and conversation. Bob? Great, thanks, thanks Tom. And again, uh, really great partnering with Tom and Ravinia on this and, and other things. Uh, we're also middle market focused. Um, we're a national interim management and advisory firm. Uh, we are headquartered in Los Angeles, but do have offices and personnel around the country uh, serving a nationwide client base. Uh, we do have three main practice areas uh, turnaround management and financial restructuring. Uh, this basically is, uh, you know, uh, operating on a triage basis, dealing with uh, trying to reduce cash burn, get some financial controls in place, assess what's what's happening. Uh, we have a performance improvement uh, practice, 
Uh, this is where we're looking for longer term success, fix it, helping fix the business, uh, drive profitability and success. Um, and then third is interim management. And this is a, where we serve in various roles, including uh, interim CEO, CFO, COO, chief restructuring officer, et cetera, uh, to, to either fill gaps uh, within a company or to um, you know, execute, develop and execute on plans um, uh, you know, going forward. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so what sets us apart? Um, you know, we do offer flexible solutions. We do not use boilerplate uh, uh, analyses. Uh, we look at each situation uh, on an individual basis. Um, we, we're very experienced uh, in terms of implementing action plans that address critical needs. And we do understand, and especially in the middle market, the need to collaborate and work with various stakeholders. So again, we're uh, very used to doing that. And again, don't come in and uh, you know, again, we, we want to the extent possible work with existing management and stakeholders. The very last thing I just want to mention as, as part of us, uh, I am having the uh, good fortune of speaking at an in-person conference coming up on July 27th and 28th. Um, uh, I know Tom and Dominic have both spoken at this group's uh, conference. It's the IMN uh, Special Assets and Credit Officers Forum in Dana Point on July 27th and 28th. If anyone on this call is interested in attending, please just shoot me an email and I'll get you registered. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right, well, we'll get right to, uh, to Jack. And uh, boy, is it, what an interesting uh, time. You've got inflation, you've got what's going on with the, the Fed. Can, uh, why don't you give us a little insight uh, that can help the uh, workout bankers uh, deal with their, uh, their credits? Sure, um, <clears throat> I have a presentation. Um, maybe just give everyone a little, just a two second background. So Crescent, uh, we started Crescent in 2017. Uh, four of us, uh, Abby Stein, Eric Becker, Doug Regan, and me, um, and kind of got rolling with our office space in early 2018, and then um, have, have uh, grown substantially since then, have offices around the country. I'm actually in our West Palm Beach office today, uh, but we're up to about 13 billion now in assets for um, individuals, high net worth individuals and families. And I would say our, probably our most consistent client is um, the CEO business owner. Um, so we have a great entrepreneurial ecosystem among our, uh, among our clients. 70% uh, <clears throat> of Crescent is owned by employees and the remaining 30% is owned by uh, our clients. So uh, with that, let's uh, launch into it. Lillian, why don't we put up the um, slide deck? I think my bottom line is I'm going to say interest rates are too low. I think probably most of you would agree with me uh, that rates are too low for current conditions. I think the Fed has pretty much uh, been outspoken in their belief in keeping overnight rates at zero through 2022 and maintaining, at least for right now, their quantitative hundred billion dollar treasury purchase, uh, uh, twenty billion dollar mortgage purchase program every month, um, indefinitely. Although um, there is some talk of tapering. Uh, uh, Jack, there was a little technical glitch, and they're trying to get the uh, uh, slides back up. But for now, if you could just they worked. Go. They worked great about ten minutes ago. It it it, it, it they did. Okay. So anyway, well, I can talk through some of those slides. Um, if you look at the, the, and I'm just gonna use the S&P 500 and other major markets as a proxy for risk-taking, equity risk-taking, uh, what you'll um, hopefully see at some point is that probably two thirds to three quarters of the total return that um, equity investors have enjoyed over the last 10 years uh, was the result of valuation expansion, uh, meaning that um, if you look at the 260%, 270% cumulative return in the S&P between 2010 through 2020, about 100 percentage points of that can be attributable to what we'll call organic, earnings growth and dividend yield, pretty much what everyone is entitled to as a shareholder. Um, the other 170 percentage points uh, was, was attributable to valuation expansion. The fact that all of a sudden 
uh, investors are willing to pay more for a dollar of earnings than they were in the previous year. And that valuation expansion, that massive valuation expansion uh, was directly related to lower and lower interest rates, interest rates below uh, fair value. All right, so if you click down a couple, there we go. Let's go up one, Lilana. There you go. All right, so this is the, this is the breakdown of, of total return for the various markets. And you can see for growth markets, it's even you know, more astounding uh, that the gray, air, the gray part of the bar is valuation expansion. Uh, the, the yellow is earnings return, and then the blue is dividends. Uh, and so you can see that, especially in growth markets, look at that Russell 1000, that you know, 75%, 80% or so, of the return that investors have enjoyed over the last 10 years was attributable to valuation expansion, thanks to ever lower and lower interest rates. And the, the problem is interest rates, as you all know, I mean, it's critical in your business, but it's critical in all kinds of business and business valuation. So the next slide, we just show the relationship uh, between uh, valuation and interest rates. Liliana, if you wouldn't mind uh, advancing to the next slide, please. So what I'm showing you here is the 10-year year, uh, essentially the PE ratio of the market uh, as a function of the 10-year yield. Uh, and you'll notice that the, um, the blue dots, if you look at that black dotted line, as it would make sense that the lower the 10-year treasury yield goes, the higher the PE ratio goes. And that's just a simple formula, right? It's the fact that if you take that PE ratio and flip it over, um, you get an earnings yield. And the lower the, the treasury yield, uh, the lower the earnings yield can be. And, and then so you flip it back over, that means that the PE ratio can be higher. So let's assume that at today's yield, 10-year treasury yield, this is the yellow uh, graphic that uh, I'm showing you here. If you, let's assume that at today's market value at thir roughly 30 times PE, that's quote unquote fair value at a 1.6% 10 year treasury yield. Um, and let's assume just for the sake of an example that the 10 year treasury yield moves to 3.5%. Uh, so you know we, we essentially go up by two percentage points. What that would suggest is assuming that the market is fairly priced today, not expensive. We're, we're not suggesting it's expensive, although you could, I could convince myself and you could probably convince yourself that the market's expensive. But assuming that it's fairly priced based on 1.6, that would say that at 3.5, uh, uh, if it were fairly valued, it would suggest a 20 times PE ratio. Well, what does that mean? That means that earnings would have to expand by 50% in order to keep prices where they are today. So clearly you have this, while we have certainly a lot of earnings growth and a lot of growth and top line growth, we've got fiscal spending, um, you know, everything going for the market near term. If this interest rates were, if interest rates were to rise, that really it has kind of a geometric effect on valuation and uh, that creates, um, you know, some headwinds. So let's assume, next slide please, that, we, uh, that we, we take a look at what we think fair value is. This is a model that we put together that just looks at current conditions. And all we're really doing is we're saying, what's the relationship between pro-cyclical copper and defensive gold? Uh, and you can see that that model is depicted in gray. The 10-year treasury yield is depicted in gold. And you can see, just based on where we are currently, and, and historically it's been a pretty good predictor, pretty good indicator of where interest rates ought to be. And now you can see that, um, you know, perhaps the Fed is, is doing some manipulation here because uh, based on these relationships, it would suggest the 10 year treasury should be about 2.8, uh, not 1.6. Um, and like I said, uh, Jay Powell and company have been on record saying they're gonna keep that overnight rate um, low um, through 2022, the 10-year rate, which is really a, uh, 
a function of quantitative easing. Really depends on what happens with tapering. Uh, I, we've heard that President uh, uh, St. Louis President um, Bullard told Bloomberg News that the Fed is waiting for 75% uh, vaccination inoculations among American adults to start tapering. Um, and given that you know there are some vaccine holdouts, you can't just simply draw a trend line from January. Uh, but we suspect in about a month uh, to six weeks, we will get to that 75% uh, vaccine rate. Uh, and then we'll hear what they have to say. Uh, my, I suspect they will start to taper. We will start to see that gold line trend closer to that gray line, and that's going to put some pressure on valuation. So next slide, please. So let's strip out. Um, so this is just the last 10 years stripping out valuation expansion and just assume that we get, instead of valuation compression, I'm not even going to go down that, that avenue. I'm just going to say, let's assume we get no valuation expansion moving forward. Where do you want to be? You can see you want to be in value oriented over growth. Uh, you want to be in large over small. Um, and you know, essentially you want you know, Russell 1000 value and you probably don't want to own small cap growth. Um, and, and that's just because of um, you know, where PE is, what you'd have to pay for earnings. Uh, and also their you know, growth stocks have pretty impecunious dividend yields. So with that, I think that's all I have. Let me stop there and throw it back to the panel. Thank you, Jack. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, you know interesting times and and hard to know uh, you know where where do you see do you see uh, inflation which you know people are seeing all sorts of uh, prices rise we're seeing some supply shortages you know there's ship shortages things having trouble coming do you see inflation kind of uh, continuing as the wage pressure or or do you see it kind of leveling off when the government support uh, starts to end. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to see a pretty, a pretty acute crescendo um, this year, later this year, and perhaps early next. Uh, it will likely revert back to um, you know longer term trends. I think that's what um, the the um, Fed funds futures is suggesting, um, uh, and, and and even uh, inflation forecasts are trending back to around two to two and a half percent growth, it's a little bit higher than where we were. But not, you know, the the four, you know, right now we're at four point two. Uh, that could go higher than that, um, at least on a year over year basis. So I think a lot of it is, you know, if you look at just the sort of textbook um, explanation of taking something that's a point in time in inflation and extending it uh, to be more consistent, it's really a function of two things: labor uh, labor costs and um, expectations. And right now, both are, are moving in the wrong direction. Now, you know, you could argue when you hear companies like McDonald's and Walmart and Amazon all talking about $15 an hour wages, you know, that's it's pretty dramatic. Um, but again, inflation is really the continual spiral of inflation higher, not necessarily a one time reset. Uh, I think we have to remember back in the 70s, uh, late 70s, uh, going into 1980, that we had a much bigger population of unionized work uh, and those unionized uh, union contracts had CPI escalators built in. So when you know, the oil embargo pushed oil prices up in 73, that sparked this reset of wages um, that then just spiraled. Um, so I, don't th I think we have a lot more flexibility in the economy nowadays than back then. Bob, so why I'm not expecting the, uh, the polling question and uh, the first polling question for the, the audience. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so the, love the audience to respond to this uh, question. Uh, Liliana, could you, uh, do we put it up on the screen? Yeah, so curious to see what the attendees view is on what will the consumer price index change be for calendar 2021? Will it be less than 3%? Three to five percent, or more than five percent. Um, the uh, it, through April, it was four point two percent year over year. I'd be curious if, uh, if if folks want to vote on that. Cool. 
I'll give you give you a moment. It's certainly going to be uh, Friday when the new uh, job report comes out. It's going to be interesting. I mean, it was such a big miss uh, last month where they thought there'd be a, a million and, and then it was 250. Uh, and then there's all people, you know, saying there's millions of jobs, people looking for work uh, are, uh, and they can't find the employees. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, I, I think there's a big debate. I, I, I definitely say that the government incentives are keeping a lot of people on the sideline. Okay. Maybe, maybe a technical glitch here as well. Uh, it doesn't seem to be registering. I'm not uh, seeing anything coming up. Uh, so I'm uh, sorry about that, but uh, let me, if you don't mind, I just do have a question for Jack. Um, Jack, so the, you're, you're, you're looking at valuations and the, the trends that you're seeing. Just curious how, how you think that might relate to the workout people and credit officers who are on this call in terms of looking at their borrowers who I think in many cases have been in a holding pattern um, and now they're going to be looking to deploy capital for new equipment, make strategic decisions, et cetera. Will, will equity stand behind those and how should, how should the, the credit folks on our call take, take what you're saying into account? Yeah, I think when you look at um, the current situation environment through a workout you know, di distressed credit lens, I wouldn't be surprised if most of you are, you know, your phones aren't ringing off the hook right now. Um, the fact is that, you know, we've got incredible top line growth with, um, you know, like I said, artificially low financing rates. So if you take, for example, not only is the benchmark rate um, too low, um, there we go. Uh, what it, it looks like, uh... Three to five. five. Three to three to five percent. Okay. Any, okay. Yeah. Nobody thinks less than three. Yeah, that's interesting. We we're seeing similar results. Um, both lumber and steel rebar has started to come down, and there looks to be a little bit of demand destruction. So at some point, you you could see that. So it's going to be interesting to see where that balance point is reached. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's interesting. Dominic, yeah, so and the point is that you know credit spreads are you know not only are rates low but credit spreads are remarkably low. I think if you look at high yield bond spreads, they're trading in below the twenty fifth percentile of their historical range. So the argument here is that lenders are still tripping over themselves to extend credit to all kinds of borrowers, high quality, low quality. So I would say you know um, at some point you know when the music does start to stop, um, you know I think that you know. People in your position, you know, you're very smart um, people who are willing to dig in and look at the, the quality of, of the assets and the quality of the, of the, the business. And there's going to be a real test. Um, you know, I know um, there are a lot of companies, uh, I like to pick on Sears, but there are a lot of companies like Sears that probably should have been out of business 10 years ago. But, you know, thanks only to low interest rates and easy financing terms that, you know, these are companies that have stayed in business uh, for as long as they have. So at some point, I think that tide is going to wash its way out. And, and, you know, as Warren Buffett says, you know, we'll see who's wearing a bathing suit or who isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, let's turn it over to, uh, to Dominic and, and let him uh, present and provide insight from the, uh, the Fed. Um. First of all, I want to thank Jack. I think that was an, an excellent overview, and I, I certainly took some notes and, and, and learned some things. Uh, so I'm on the banking supervision side and not necessarily the monetary policy side, so I, I won't I, I, um, um, offer um, as much information or insights on what the, the Fed's monetary policy uh, thinking is. I would... Uh, sort of refer you to what has been some of the, the statements out of the FOMC. But what I can say is, you know, there's there's a lot of concern about inflation and from everything that I've heard internally that the Fed believes uh, most of our economists suggest that it's more transitory. And you see the, the segments of the economy that are experiencing the most inflation tend to be the segments that were most adversely impacted by the pandemic. So you see the kind of the bounce back uh, impact of um, 
uh, kind of the economy is opening up again. And so that seems to be somewhat transitory and whether or not higher inflation uh, impacts uh, the, the Fed's um, posture on monetary policy is yet, yet to be seen. Everything that we're hearing is that because the expectation is that it's transitory, it won't um, change uh, the Fed's posture on monetary policy. Um, however, the FOMC meets in a, in, in a week or so, and so we'll, we'll see if, um, if anything changes. So with, with that, uh, I want to talk about uh, housing. I am the subject matter expert in uh, residential real estate at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. A little bit about the Atlanta Fed. Atlanta Fed is sort of the a center for real estate for the Federal Reserve System. Uh, we have experts in residential and commercial. Part of, the, part of this was a byproduct of the, the last downturn when we had a a significant impact in 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 both commercial and residential real estate in our district. So we beefed up expertise, and that expertise kind of is provided for the, for the vet system. Um, I uh, regularly do presentations and outreach, not just within our system, but uh, you know, uh, without with not just within our district, but across the system and external parties uh, like yourself. I do have to give one caveat that my views. Are my views and don't necessarily represent the views of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, Milano, or the Board of Governors. All right. With that being said, I just want to talk um, a little bit about what, what I'm seeing in housing. I will touch on commercial real estate a little bit, and I'll give some thoughts on the regulatory po uh, posture that the Fed um, has taken uh, so far, and some thoughts about uh, a little bit of some thoughts about the future. So, so, so talking about housing, housing has um, been one of the few bright spots over the, over the past year. We've seen a tremendous growth in, um, in, in housing demand. And I sort of consider it taking place in, in two waves. So there was demand generated for housing that was really sparked by, as Jack mentioned, very low interest rates. So buyers saw uh, low rates. They wanted to either refinance their mortgage or they took advantage of the opportunity to buy um, a, a house that, you know, low rates made it a little bit more affordable. Uh, however, what's happened is you had an increase in demand, but not a uh, subsequent increase in supply. And so that resulted in this, this upward pressure on, on home prices almost everywhere. Um, and as a result, uh, not only did homes get more expensive, but people had a whole lot more equity. And so what we're seeing now today is, so the first wave of demand was really generated by low int interest rates. Uh, I would consider kind of the second half of last year, we've seen a, a growth in activity driven by uh, 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 homeowners that have a significant amount of equity, they're able to cash out and make investments in real estate. And so if you look at March of last year, 15% uh, of, of existing home sales were to all cash buyers. Uh, in March of this year, that was 25% of, of the market. Actually, I think that's April's number is 25%. Wow. And, um, and so what's happened is the demand is, uh, is shifting from high cost markets to low cost markets. So if you're in New York or New Jersey or in California, you have a lot of equity in your house, there isn't any inventory that you can really afford um, in those markets. So you, you cash out in, uh, of California and you buy a house in Texas, or uh, we've seen tremendous growth from people from moving from California to markets like Idaho or, or Phoenix or Las Vegas. And consequently, what's happened is if you come to a market that, uh, you know, say in, the, uh, in San Jose, average home price, median home price is a million dollars, you cash out, you go to market market like uh, Las Vegas, you have a whole bunch of cash, you can pay well above asking price. Uh, and if, if the a property doesn't appraise, you can kind of make up the difference because you have the cash. And we're seeing that all over the place. And the result has been, um, you know, if you're a local buyer, you're sort of priced out of the market because transferees from other markets have a whole bunch of cash that they can sort of um, outprice your local buyers. And we've seen tremendous, that's caused 
even more upward pressure on prices. So the beginning part of this year, I think our March number for home price appreciation was 12%, 12.5%. That's probably the highest we've seen since, since the 2006 in terms of appreciation. And the net result of that has been a decline in housing affordability almost everywhere. And uh, of we have a the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta uh, has a, um, a a public tool that we make available uh, called the Home Ownership Affordability Monitor, and I will put a, a link to it in in the chat if if anyone would like to go to it. Um, we track housing affordability uh, for um, uh, every market. Uh, every major MSA in the country, and we go down to the to the county level, so you can track affordability at kind of very sub market levels. And um, of our markets, uh, we cover maybe over six hundred uh, MSAs in um, in metro divisions. In, in our monitor, we had about eighty percent of our metro areas saw a decline in affordability last month. Um, um, well, that's in March was the last month that we have data for. And that is because it, even though interest rates have been at historic lows, we're still seeing a decline in affordability, mostly because home prices have gone up significantly. Um, and so the net result of that has been, if you look at home sales, home sales have contracted. Uh, the latest number from NAR is home sales are down about 2.7%. If you look at mortgage originations, they've also slowed. We're still, you know, high relative to where we were last year, but we are starting to see the slowdown in activity. And it, presumably it's buyers feeling that, you know, prices are getting a little bit high. Um, so some of the concerns that, you know, again, these are my, this is my, my opinion. Um, I do think that there is some long-term, there will be a long-term challenge in housing affordability. We talked to builders, uh, my gosh, um, I, I, I know you mentioned it a second ago, we've seen some um, uh, um, uh, alleviation of some pressure on, on lumber prices, but man, the, the cost escalation for home builders has been extraordinary and home builders have just elected to limit sales. So if you see decline in new home sales, it's not because demand has slowed, it's because builders are intentionally slowing sales because they can't, they can't keep pace with cost. Um, and that's, that's been a, a big issue in, in the new home, uh, new home space. We also have seen uh, new, uh, this is sort of anecdotal, but new home builders uh, I've talked to have told me in the past year, they've seen an increase in investor activity, mostly from investors looking to build uh, rental portfolios. And what's happened is uh, single family, new, con new construction, single family houses that are purposed for rentals are so sort of, or bought for rentals are taking place of uh, apartment developments in the suburbs because there's a lot of restriction on multifamily development. So what's happening is, you know, with just uh, investors are buying up new, new constructed homes and using them as rental properties to sort of make up the demand. And they anticipate buyers not being able to afford to purchase a home. So they're building up rental portfolios to kind of take advantage of that market in the future. Uh, Don, so Dominic, in long, I, yes, Dominic, yes, sure. I interject and just ask you a question. I, I saw a statistic sure. yesterday from the American Bankruptcy Institute that said 11 million Americans are behind on rent right now. And I'm not quite sure how I feel about that number. On one hand, it seems like it might be low, but uh, how would that affect, uh, you know, again, what, what you're talking about now about, uh, you know, the, the, the rental market and, and impact on, on real estate values? Um, so if I, if I segment the market from single family rental to multifamily, the, the single family rental market is, uh, has sort of matured since the last crisis because so many uh, institution investors have flooded the market. They've been able to build portfolios of properties. They're not seeing as much um, uh bar uh, renters behind on their 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 payments as multifamily is seen um on the multifamily side uh there is um there is concern that um there are a lot of renters that have taken advantage of the moratoriums on evictions and um haven't been paying rent 
it will be interesting to see when, um, so I think the moratoriums extend to the end of June. It'd be interesting to see whether or not um, those renters are, are able to, uh, to go back into making their rent payments. Yeah. One thing is not as big of concern because even still multifamily, uh, if you look at vacancy rates, still are relatively low, um, particularly in the, this B and C space. And so if there is a wave of evictions, which I'm not sure if we'll see, um, I don't, I'm not sure it will impact uh, valuations in the multifamily space because we just are, are still, we're, we're still at capacity. Um, Dominic, there was a question too from uh, Ron Freed. Uh, when you refer to cash out, are you talking about cash out refinancing of existing properties to purchase others or cash out due to the sale of a higher valued properties in more expensive regions with relocation to less expensive housing markets? That is an excellent question. And I was just about to get to that. And the things that I'm concerned about is actually both, right? So there are people who are in high cost markets, selling their homes, moving to low cost markets, able to pay cash for a house and still have some money to spare. Um, and they're kind of uh, pushing up prices in your low cost markets. We are seeing, uh, so the share of cash out refis is, is not growing. So it's still a, 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 a small share of refis. The amount, the dollar amount of cash out refis is expanding. And so what I, what I take away from that is there are, um, uh, it, it sort of corresponds to higher um, equity in homes. So people that have uh, seen uh, increased home price appreciation, uh, home value appreciation, um, they're able to cash out. And really where we're seeing a lot of that cash go is either buying uh, investment properties or buying second home properties. And the the actual dollar amount is, is expanding pretty rapidly, even though the share of cash out refis has not. And that brings up a little bit, one concern I have, obviously have if you're if you are buying at the top of the market or if you're cashing out at the top of the market with the cash out refi you know um, there is some concern whether or not the collateral value um, the collateral may be overvalued and the value may may um, decline a little bit as the market corrects I am it's something that I'm paying attention to. I don't think it's it's an overwhelming concern right now. It's simply because inventory is so low. We still are at, even though inventory has started to, to increase a little bit with the slowdown in sales, we're still at 2.2 months supply of inventory. And we should be somewhere between four to six. So I'm not concerned with um, kind of home prices going down if there's a contraction in demand and that may create a risk for collateral valuations. Um, but it's something to pay it, pay attention to because it's very submarket specific, right? So if you're in a certain submarket where prices are actually overvalued, you may be at a higher risk than a more mature market where va value is a little bit more realistic. Um, Tom, Dominic, you had a, a question? Yeah. Um, yes. You know, with the uh, beginning of the pandemic, uh, everybody thought the world was mm -hmm. going to come to an end and, uh, you know, banks reserved huge amounts for uh, loans, and then they, they shifted a lot of people off the line to work out. And regulators were kind of saying, you know, let, you know, kind of don't criticize loans and, 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 and go easy on, on people. And as time went on, um, it, it turned out there, there just wasn't a lot of uh, defaults uh, expected, a lot of that due to the, uh, the government coming in and, and helping. Um, but then the, the bank started shifting the people off of workout and, and back into the line. And then the reserves now people are drawing down, but what is the, the, um, do you, can you give us some insight to what the fed is saying now, it, it, you know, we're before they were saying hold back, or, you know, do they have a, a, a posture that, you know, the workout bankers can kind of, uh, you know, take, you know, cause I've heard different things. Yeah, and I, it's it's because um, members of the FOMC surprisingly people uh, 
when we think about the Fed's position, it's kind of one position, but there there's some divergent opinions even within the FOMC. But overall, what what I've heard is that first the the you know we were just as surprised as everyone else that we didn't see a, a wave of um of of distressed assets and big problems like we saw before. Um, and, and so we our, our banks are in pretty good position and they, you know, if they've had loans that were um, in forbearance, we're seeing those loans fall off and go back into re- being in, in repayment, even before some of the, the uh, forbearance periods expire. Um, so we're very, very confident and optimistic just within our banks. We know that from, from a mortgage perspective, a lot of mortgages are are today are being originated by non-banks and it's hard to sort of gauge, you know, how those loans are performing. But overall, there's some cost, cautious optimism about where we are. In terms of our posture, we have we uh, began the pandemic very uh, accommodating and, and encouraging our lenders to work with borrowers um, as much as possible. Um, you know, that accommodation, uh, uh, accommodative, posture is, is, is still in effect. And we're still encouraging lenders to work with their borrowers. And I can't speak for other regulators, only can kind of speak for the Fed. So that, that seems to be what, where, where we are. However, um, there is, uh, we are encouraging, uh, just internally the conversations that I've had, we're encouraging banks to uh, be prepared to move to a more um, uh, uh, traditional uh, um, way of evaluating distressed assets. Um, at some point, some of the federal accommodation is gonna to come to an end and we have to figure out how to, to, uh, to deal with, you know, borrowers that are behind on their payments. You know, there are some, um, there are some options to kind of get people back to, in terms of the mortgage, the residential mortgage side is option to get people back into repayment. And we want, um, you know, our, our banks to, to kind of work with borrowers as much as possible, but it just overall, just, you know, it, it is advisable to be prepared to um, later on this year, as some of the, the, the moratoriums and forbearance periods come to an end to be prepared to, to uh, work with borrowers to get them back to making payments. Also be prepared to look, to move to a more traditional way of looking at distressed assets. Thank you, that's helpful. Bob, why don't you do the second polling question? Um, then we'll do COVID sure. and we'll open up to questions with the time left. Sure, sounds good. Yeah, if, uh, if you Thank you, Dominic. Put that up on the, on the screen, that'd be great. Yeah, so the, the question is, what will the 10-year Treasury note yield be as of the end of this year? We've been talking about it. It's been running right around 1.6%, fluctuating uh, over the past several days, weeks. Uh, predicted it'll be less than one and a half, between one and a half and two, or is it going to be more than 2%? So if, if yep. you uh, could- Well, we're waiting for the results yeah, just ahead. to kind of uh, relate mm-hmm. to where I- been studying recently kind of the, the history of workout in a sense since uh, 99, since the intercom bubble. And it seems like there was the most workout between 99 and 2005. And that's when the Fed actually did raise rates. And so, uh, and then really since then, there's only other than 2009, there's not been a period of real workout. It's been very light. And that's because the Fed has been so accommodative. And like Jack was talking in the beginning, the value of companies keeps going up. So any loans, we talked to a member in 2009 about a wall of debt coming, the refine. Well, all that got refinanced. And until the rates are really uh, coming up in 2018, there was a talk about, they started raising rate and then there was the taper tantrum. Uh, and then they reverted because they got scared. And uh, But so the question is, are they bluffing this time? It, it, you know, and I, I think that they're going to be for real, and like Jack talked about, and, and Dominic, they're, they're going to talk this week. But when when people start to realize that the rates are going to go up, I think then you're going to see those values that Jack to 30 time uh, and, and private companies right now, the average, by the way, is 14 times. Uh, you know, so all all these lend, loans that have been like loose are easy to refinance and they're in the money. 
But when the interest rates start to really go up, the money's going to rush into those higher yielding uh, um, bond instruments and treasuries. And that's when I think we're going to see a, a, a large wave of uh, the next wave of workout. Okay, so um, looks like everybody kind of is playing it down the middle. I personally think it's going to go up more than uh, 2% uh, just as people start to realize that it's, it's going to go start to normalize. Um, okay, Cobus, uh, how about uh, you're up? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, Liliana, if you could um, put that last slide up for me, that would be appreciated. But what I'm about to show is the what they call the, the walking dead. It's the Russell 3000. Earlier we saw from Jack the Russell 2000 um, performance of the value. Um, they, you still see the Russell 2000. And, but this shows the Russell 3000 companies that, that are not able to, to repay their, their debt. That's basically issuing new debt to cover old debt. And this trend, this is a long chart. You see we are now, and this is as of September last year, um, I this morning I got an update as of end of January. We're now over that peak. We're now into the 20 percent. Um, so we, we've made a new high. So the point here is two things. The one is that you will see that that last peak, COVID peak, is only that last bar up. There was a problem even before COVID, which is important to know. Um, so a lot of zombie companies are going around and the banks have, have these zombies or they may be um, publicly listed companies um, that, that are really highly levered. And now with COVID, it's even worse. My problem is that there's no lineup at the firm like ours for these type of zombies to be worked out. And it's a great dilemma. We don't understand it. We, so the question I'm asking is, even though it's a simple reason, really, who will not take more money um, if the Fed makes it available for them various, through various programs, rather than, than taking a, a consultant or a, a, a workout type of uh, approach to, to making the firm leaner? Um, so my question is really, what is preventing one bank or one banker from starting to, to make a difference anyway. And that's what we've been doing at Ravinia is um, the few companies that do um, are unable to find the refinancing capital. We, we work with them and we, we work with them and we get them leaner and we, we do the responsible thing. Even in this market where, where we feel that these, lever, these um, amount of capital out there is forcing companies to make really silly decisions, we, we are taking those few companies um, and, and working them back to, to, to within their covenant ratios. And we, we would want to hear from the audience as bank, as special asset bankers, what is preventing you from doing that same thing? And um, why are more of these zombie companies not, not um, being, being worked out? And in the future, when programs are being made available to companies, um, it should come with some strings attached so that the core fundamental problems in these businesses can be addressed while they get new funding. We understand that during COVID, a lot of industries needed the funding, but uh, as time goes by, those, those companies must come back within covenant ratios so that they can be sustainable for a long term. That'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Excellent. Appreciate that. Uh, Robert, how about the third and final polling question? Then we'll open it up for uh, general questions. Sure. And if you put it up there, so the, uh, Liliana, if you could put that up there. Uh, this question is regarding uh, default rates. So on leveraged loans, uh, what do you think the trailing 12 month default rate will be on leveraged loans? This is uh, per Fitch. It was 3.3% as of April, 2021. Uh, just historically, it had gone up considerably at the beginning of COVID and has really trailed down uh, significantly. So uh, if you could do that. And by the way, just to, while, while the votes are being tabulated, Cobus, I thought your, your, your chart was fascinating. And I think using that measure of interest versus uh, 
uh, profitability versus debt uh, interest costs also, you know, would be further exacerbated by, you know, situations where there's been deferred rent and now companies need to, you know, start, you know, taking care of that. You know, they've had uh, uh, their other operating efficiencies masked by, you know, PPP loan, you know, money that's come in. Uh, also, you know, if, if they are able to get in a position to grow, there's going to be working capital needs in order to grow. So I just wanted to say, I thought your chart was really interesting. And I think there's a lot of other factors that make even more companies probably in that category. Um, you know, yeah. and thank Go you. Ahead, yeah, but I've, I'm very concerned about the moral hazard that's being created by by the amount of, of capital out there. There's so much we, we heard earlier from Jack and other people saying there's so much money chasing targets right now. And I don't know if you heard end of April, this value investor jumped from a, a skyscraper in Manhattan, um, Charles Duval. Um, and his value fund was liquidated just a week or so before he jumped. And that is, he didn't want to live in a world where he's forced to, to make investments that he doesn't really believe in. And how much more are you going to get once there is a correction and just the moral has it of a whole, a whole generation of people growing up in thinking that things are fundable that, that really should, shouldn't be. That's a big concern um, to me. Well, here's the, uh, the results. And I think again, down the middle, although uh, I, I bet you this is higher than the average people. And, and to answer your question, Kobus, I, I think as far as, uh, you know, I think as the workout bankers know that the banks are under a lot of pressure, the people on the line, the development people to, uh, to make loans, to put money out there. And uh, it's very competitive right now. And so, uh, and the people making the loans, they're not necessarily gonna be the ones working them out. Uh, yeah. But I would recommend uh, for the workout bankers, that now is a great time to actually uh, be kind of pushing out the, uh, the, the weaker credits because there's, we, we, we have people lining up the door to, you know, with funds to like, they're calling nonstop. Do you have any distressed deals for us? Do you have any, you know, so there's a lot of uh, people with capital right now uh, that's, that would take it off your hands. Now, the things that one thing about distress, and this goes back to whether you're talking about the tulip bulb crisis uh, bubble, you're talking about the 29 crash, whatever it is, it's always uh, the market is in two mindsets. It's either all go or then it uh, is all go. And so, the, you know, I remember 2009, it was you couldn't find a bank out there uh, to make a loan on. And, you know, about it, the best deals were made during that period. So now it's a good time to be proactive in my mind. It, it, we, we ran some auctions uh, during the pandemic and had 16 topping bids. So it's a it's a great time to be proactive. Yeah, and so, people like uh, myself and Bob have people available to do that now. And when that window um, slams shut again, um, then, then it changes. So it's a good time, both from a capital availability and the availability of, of turnaround people that can make a difference um, to, to do that work now. Yep. Yeah. Uh, now, here's a question. The walking dead chart is a measure of profits to interest with no apparent consideration given the cash flow or free cash flow. Well, the point. one that I showed is based on EBITDA, and there's another one that only uses um, EBIT that does not include a depreciation. Um, but that that is that is um, very close to cash flow. It's as good as you as you get. Um, uh, so I think it is a good reflection. Any final questions or uh, anything a panelist wants to add, Robert? Jack, Jack, a question. Yeah, uh, I'd be curious, uh, again, looking at, again, future valuations, um, you know, with the move from, you know, direct stimulus payments to, you know, an infra potential infrastructure bill, um, any thoughts on kind of, you know, where, where you think, uh, where, where you think people should be, like, what, you know, what, uh, who's going to benefit from that? Yeah, I know, it's a, it, it, that's a great question. I spend a lot of my time on macro. Um, and I do think that, and I'm sure many of you would agree with me that America has under invested in manufacturing and logistics capabilities. Um, we actually uh, have partnered with, um, uh, well, actually Larry Levy's real estate team is now our team. Um, and we're doing uh, build and sell uh, 
uh, industrial buildings, logistics centers, warehouses, fulfillment centers around the country. So we're going to do, we're just embarking on a five-year plan. I think we're raising a um, hundred million, I believe. Um, and we're literally just building and selling um, industrial properties nationwide. So we, we do think there's a, a huge opportunity for uh, reshoring of manufacturing. Obviously, a lot of it's going to have to carry some incentives, but I think um, that trend is our friend. No, I agree. I see it with semiconductors as well. Um, a lot of those manufacturers in, in Arizona are now bringing things home, and a lot of these shortages will drive those type of decisions, yeah. Matthew Howe asked, the Federal Reserve recently indicated their concerns on current valuations of assets. How does the panel view in terms of potential workout credits? Dominic? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this, this may be a, a, a better question for um, you know, some of the other panelists that's kind of reacting to it, but I, you know, I, uh, I, I sort of share some of the concern that we, we may, some assets are, particularly the residential side, are, are, are overvalued. But it'd be interesting to see how other people think that may in, impact uh, the workouts. Uh, just to add on to that, and, and thanks for the question, Matt. Um, you know, just looking at an article I read yesterday from uh, an organization I, I, I follow, the Secured Finance Network, and they noted that, you know, that you know, even though as the uh, output recovers to pre-pandemic levels, there's pockets of stress emerging, you know, manufacturers struggling to obtain key inputs, sectors are reporting difficulties finding enough workers, uh, rebounding consumer demand is putting, you know, pressure on prices, et cetera. So I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the stress is there. And you know, again, it does seem to us uh, that, yeah, you know, that there is going to be increased activity on the workout side. Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on pricing power, right? If if you can pass your co costs along, you'll you know be able to you know thrive. Um, if you're a price taker, you're going to get squeezed. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, I think that's going to conclude. I, I guess uh, I wish everybody. Uh, it's going to. It's an interesting time. Everybody's now starting to go out. I hope everybody, the workout bankers. Uh, and enjoy their summer. And I think uh, given what I've heard on this panel, they should get ready. It's gonna become a, a, a busy time again. Um, but uh, right now, uh, relative uh, easy credit continues uh, for the time being. And uh, we appreciate all the panelists, Dominic, Jack, Kobus, thank you. Uh, Robert and uh, the Sierra team, I wanna thank. They've been uh, great. Uh, my Ravinia team to help put this together. and. Uh, I hope that uh, everybody got something out of this and uh, feel free to contact uh, any of us uh, if we can help with, uh, with anything, with a, a sale or a refinance or uh, a Sierra can help with, um, with uh, consulting and interim consulting and Cobus can help with profit improvement. And uh, thank you everybody. And we look thank forward you. to uh, staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you everyone. Enjoyed it. Bye.